Let's take a look at a fighter that should have been produced, the F-16 XL. The F-16 XL is a cranked arrow delta wing variant of the hugely successful F-16 Fighting Falcon, or Viper. Initially conceived as a technology demonstrator for General Dynamics, the F-16 XL was entered into the Enhanced Tactical Fighter competition. Let's take a look at some of the specifications for the F-16 XL. Length 54 feet 2 inches Height 17 feet 7 inches Wingspan 34 feet 3 inches Maximum speed 1,400 miles per hour or Mach 2.0 plus Empty weight 22,000 pounds Maximum takeoff weight 48,000 pounds Range 2,850 miles Engine thrust with the General Electric F110 GE100 turbofan 17,100 pounds of thrust dry or 28,900 pounds of thrust with afterburner Similar to the production F-16 the F-16 XL was armed with an internal M61 20mm Vulcan Gatling gun, which was capable of firing 6,000 rounds a minute or 100 rounds per second. However, due to its much larger wing, the F-16 XL had an incredible 27 hardpoints, which were divided as follows. One centerline station, two wingtip stations, 16 underwing stations, each with a capacity of 750 pounds. Four semi-recessed AIM-120 AMRAN stations under the fuselage. Two wing heavy or wet stations. And two chin lantern stations. This allowed the F-16XL to carry an impressive 15,000 pounds of payload. And given its larger wing with more fuel capacity, the F-16 XL could carry it much farther than the production F-16. To learn how the F-16 XL came about, we first have to go back to the mid-1970s, when new Soviet fighters and advanced air defense systems began to appear. As a result, the U.S. Air Force began to realize that along with increased maneuverability and larger payloads, high-efficiency supersonic performance over long ranges was needed. After several conferences during 1976 and 1977, it was deemed that supercruise performance would significantly improve chances for mission success. At the same time, NASA had concluded working on a supersonic transport or SST program. And while the SST program was canceled, Results of the SST and related studies illustrated the benefits of a cranked arrow or double delta wing. The double delta wing provides high top speed while also maintaining good handling qualities at both high and low speeds. This is done by having a wing which has both a high sweep on the inboard panel for low drag at supersonic speeds and a low sweep on the outboard panel to provide better handling and maneuverability at subsonic speeds. It is important to note that the double delta wing actually has its origins in Sweden, where Saab pioneered the design in their J-35 Draken, which first flew in 1954. Following the research done for civilian airliner applications, Langley soon initiated a study focusing on military applications, known as the Supersonic Cruise Integrated Fighter, or SCIF, program. The goal of SCIF was to cultivate the use of supercruise technologies in fighter aircraft. The SCIF designs were numbered sequentially and were wind tunnel tested over a wide Mach number range. The SCIF Model 4 was optimized for a cruise of Mach 1.8 and envisioned as an air superiority variant. Both the SCIF 4 and SCIF models were tested extensively and the results of the SCIF program, along with all the interest in supercruise technologies, led NASA to collaborate with General Dynamics on the Supersonic Cruise and Maneuver Prototype or SCAMP program. The SCAMP program was a natural fit for General Dynamics and the F-16. The F-16 makes use of a modular construction approach, which lends itself to taking production examples and making structural changes for testing relatively quick and inexpensive. The F-16 was the winner of the Lightweight Fighter Program, or LWF, and was the result of extensive work by a group known as the Fighter Mafia, which included John Boyd and Harry Hilliker. 
Harry Hilliker is considered the father of the F-16 and was advocating improvements to the design that fit with the SCAMP requirements. As such, General Dynamics teamed up with NASA to take an F-16 airframe and made it with a wing that would provide both supersonic cruisability as well as subsonic maneuverability. Initial testing was done at the Langley Research Center starting with wind tunnel mock-ups and technical analysis. This led to the development of the Model 400. For the Model 400, the inboard leading edge sweep angles was 76.6 degrees and the outboard wing had a sweep of 66.6 degrees. Additionally, the Model 400 had both inboard and outboard leading edge flaps that could extend up to 60 degrees. And finally, the Model 400 made use of a movable vertical tail and all moving wingtips for stability. When these tests showed promising results, General Dynamics internally funded development of a flight demonstrator to further explore this concept. Envision was an advanced F-16 that could fly farther, carry more payload, and supercruise. Further testing led to refinements of the SCAMP design, and along with funding from the Air Force, ultimately two flying examples were developed and produced. These became known as the F-16 XL. The F-16 XL's wing had evolved to have an inboard leading edge sweep of 70 degrees and an outboard crank section of 50 degrees. Additionally, in order to accommodate the larger wing, the fuselage was also lengthened by over 50 inches. As compared to the production F-16, the XL's drag during wings level acceleration in 1G flight was comparable, and lift to drag ratios were better across the entire supersonic speed range. The larger wing of the F-16 XL increased fuel capacity by an astounding 82% and allowed it to carry twice the payload of the F-16 while delivering it 40% farther. In 1981, the Air Force officially announced the program to replace the F-111. This program became known as the Enhanced Tactical Fighter or ETF. The ETF requirements were to produce a single fighter which could operate deep strike missions without the need of escort or jamming aircraft. The requirements emphasize both long range and large weapon payloads. Ultimately, two final designs were submitted, the F-15E and the F-16XL. While the F-15E was very similar to the already existing in-production two-seat F-15D trainer, the F-16XL was basically a major redesign. Despite promising results from the F-16XL, ultimately the Air Force went with the F-15E Strike Eagle as the winner of the competition. So, why did the F-16XL lose out? One of the main issues was related to cost. Since the F-16XL was significantly structurally different from the production version, substantial costs would be incurred to create a production line to mass produce the new wing. Additionally, as these requirements called for a long-range strike fighter, the Air Force felt that having only one engine was too risky as a strike fighter would likely be exposed to substantial anti-aircraft fire. Furthermore, while the double delta wing of the F-16XL added much more range and payload, during tight sustained turns, airspeed and energy bled off rapidly. This was seen as a major disadvantage by the Air Force. Despite all these shortcomings, some have asked why the Air Force didn't just choose both the F-15E and the F-16XL. After all, the F-16 was designed to complement the F-15 in the Air Force's favored low-high mix, and a derivative of the F-15 should also be accompanied by a derivative of the F-16. In fact, some of the team members who worked on the F-16XL recognized the need for the F-15E and that the XL was forced into competition with the F-15E so there could be a winner. Additionally, it is important to note that along with the ETF program, the Air Force had some simultaneous and highly secret programs running concurrently, namely the F-117 Nighthawk and the Advanced Tactical Fighter or ATF program. The ATF program would go on to produce the F-22, and much of the wing research data obtained by the F-16XL was applied to the F-22. At the end of the day, there were just too many competing projects. In fact, many have referred to the F-16XL as a great idea at the wrong time. While the F-16XL did not make it into production, the two flying examples were pressed into NASA service as research vehicles after several years in storage. Initially partaking in the High Speed Research or HSR program, it was felt that NASA was best suited to study the effects and feasibility of commercial supersonic travel. 
And although supersonic travel had been studied and implemented in aircraft like the Concorde, the HSR was looking to develop new technologies to take supersonic travel into the 21st century. It was hoped that a cranked aero delta wing passenger jet could achieve speeds of Mach 2.2 and carry 300 passengers. Ironically, it was this research that saved the two flying F-16 XLs from destruction by live fire exercises by the Air Force. NASA recognized the F-16 XL as an ideal research platform for Supersonic Laminar Flow Control, or SLFC, and requested the two XLs as part of their research efforts. The Air Force agreed, and the first F-16 XL, known as XL-1, was given the NASA designation 849, with 8 representing a Dryden research aircraft. Aircraft 849 initially flew test flights with an SR-71 to study sonic boom properties. The second F-16XL, or XL-2, was redesignated by NASA as Aircraft 848. I'm not sure why it has a lower sequence number, but that's what they did. And powered by the more powerful GE F-110 GE-129 engine. It is interesting to note that 848 achieved super cruise with this improved engine, albeit too late for the competition with the F-15. Getting back to the SLFC research, after testing a smaller aerodynamic glove on Aircraft 849, Aircraft 848 was then fitted with an experimental titanium glove which contained 12 million tiny holes to study laminar flow over the wing. Interestingly enough, the glove used induced suction which was generated by a modified Boeing 707 turbo compressor located where the ammunition bay for the Vulcan cannon resided. These experiments showed that it was possible to achieve laminar airflow over most of a highly swept wing at supersonic speeds by using an active suction system. Along with these studies, the F-16XLs were also used to research noise associated with supersonic travel and in the vicinity of airports. While the research was promising, it turned out that the costs to produce such a glove on a civilian airliner were deemed far too expensive for commercial aviation use. In the end, it was decided that supersonic laminar flow control was not a near-term attainable technology, and so the program was canceled. However, this was not the end of the F-16XL's contribution to research. The Cranked Aero Wing Aerodynamics Program, or CAWAP, effort conducted extensive studies on vortex flows over highly swept wings. Ultimately, the program became international in scope with several nations participating in the research effort and data analysis. One of the more interesting studies conducted as part of the CAWAP program were the flow visualization studies, which mounted several cameras on the F-16 XL. This data was then used to create and modify computer models which modeled vortex flow over and around the wings. In addition, extensive pressure and temperature analysis studies were conducted using sophisticated instrumentation and data capture techniques. All of this led to enormous contributions to the relatively new field of computational fluid dynamics or CFD, along with its related design tools which are still used today. The F-16XL's contribution to the art and science that is aerospace cannot be understated. And finally, the F-16XL made extensive use of aeroelasticity tailored composite laminates. This improved stiffness which made the wing more rigid and durable. Today the aerospace industry sees wide use of these applications which were largely pioneered by the F-16XL. By 1999, all testing had concluded and both F-16XLs were placed into storage at NASA Dryden. However, for a time, it looked like the XL program would once again be resurrected. In 2007, Lockheed Martin was approached by NASA to determine the cost of returning aircraft 849 to airworthiness and upgrade the avionics to more modern standards. Aircraft 849 was taken out of storage powered up and taxied. This would be the last time an XL operated under its own power. The effort was canceled and both XLs were finally retired in 2009. Today, they are stored and displayed at Edwards Air Force Base. 
In the end, F16XL1 logged over 530 hours, while XL2 logged over 400 hours, putting their combined flight time at just under 940 hours. What do you think? Should the F-16XL have been put into production? Was it unfairly compared to the F-15E? Let me know in the comments below. Thanks for watching. I immensely enjoyed researching this wonderful aircraft and making this video. Please subscribe and click on the bell for notifications if you'd like to see more. There's also a link to my Discord server in the description below. Stay safe everyone and see you next time.